guys. I'm Andrew Baker. Can't get this. And uh, here to talk a little bit about process. So um, I know we've had pretty heavy dev content so far, uh, and hopefully this intrigues some people. Out of a show of hands, how many uh, how many people consider themselves to be a designer in some fashion? Cool. So we've got the right room. Uh, I'll give you guys a little bit of background on uh, where I come from. Uh, I'm a design technologist at Karsh Hagen. Uh, we're an ad agency on South Broadway, about 65 people. Um, the, the title just kind of made it up, slash did some research about uh, titles around the industry, looked at creative technologists. That one's washed up, fuck that title. Uh, hopefully no one's a creative technologist. Uh, and I found this title actually out of a company called Method in uh, London, and they had a title basically for someone who is a UX design and front-end developer. Um, and that kind of sums up what I do. And if you were to break it down into day-to-day -day roles, these are the things that I do. Uh, and you know, what is a design technologist? Why does that mean? It sounds kind of fluffy. Um, essentially. The way we landed on this uh, this stack, if you will, is because I was the first developer at Karshagen, um, still the only developer at Karshagen, uh, and I was the second hire in our interactive now technology team. So when you're on a small team, you guys know where you wear a lot of hats. People who work in agencies, you know you wear a lot of, ha a lot of hats. Um, just to give you that example, kind of how it started, First day of the agency life, uh, my boss, who's awesome, taught me a lot. Uh, you know, taking me through. I'm just out of college, so let's get this user flow campaign or this user flow mapped out for this banner campaign. Well, my first reaction, of course, like any uh, good college liberal arts educated uh, student, is to go to Google. What is a user flow? Um, so the second week, you know, I started. Well, I started doing a lot of UX. I had always been a. I've had a background in design for a long time, so I've had my hand in the design side for a while and learned code in college, just very basic front end stuff. And uh, as I got in, I was building little landing pages, um, small front end work. And you get this comment from your boss. You know, the landing page looks great. This is a banking client. The landing page for this banner campaign. Uh, looks great, but I think we're having some layout issues in IE6. Uh, this was five years ago. So this is me uh, in that moment, just sheer frustration, not knowing if this career is right for me. But, you know, you learn, you grow, you build, and uh, we've, we've come a long way. We've gotten better. Um, since then, we have now a team about five or six in our technology team. We're part of the creative team as a whole. We made that shift just this last year. And like I said, this talk is going to be about process um, and how our process has evolved in seeing inefficiencies, seeing frustrations that come with uh, various traditional waterfall processes. So um, these are kind of the reasons why I would say that, that we've, we've arrived here. Uh, we have small teams that allow you to work interdisciplinary, really hands-on and collaborative. Um, client transparency, that's something that I have found to be hugely, hugely beneficial. You know, some agencies I've heard are very kind of behind closed doors. You're not telling your client if you're working with external developers. You're not telling your client if, if you're doing these various things. And we found that being completely open and transparent with your client is always going to help. Um, technology and process agnostic. So that one's got a caveat. Uh, when I say process agnostic, that really means we, we still follow processes, but we pick the process based on the project and the client at hand. So um, it's not to say that we don't have a process, but that our process evolves based on the requirements, based on the scope, based on the budget, et cetera. Um, when I say technology agnostic, that means that we, we don't push any technology stack on any of our projects. Uh, we. We'll do a, a Drupal project, we'll do a Node project, we'll do a Rails project, we'll do a WordPress project. Uh, it just depends on what we need to do and what, what makes the best sense for the client. I think that's something that uh, I've taken as a huge value when you talk about uh, dev shops or firms who really push their stack and can get the client in a lot of trouble uh, in the end. And at the end, we're just figuring shit out. That's what I think a big takeaway from this whole conference. 
something I've learned from Drew since day one, just figure shit out. So, uh, small interdisciplinary teams. Um, this is kind of our, like I said, we have about five or six people. This account strategist person is, is in our account side. And not all of these people are on every one of our projects. If we have a small campaign site, you know, we're not going to involve our experience planner necessarily thoroughly. Our experience planner is the person who basically does uh, all of our UX spec work. So site flows, user personas, et cetera. And we'll get into some of that detail um, later. But this is kind of the roles that we play. And uh, I'm their design technologist. Uh, sometimes I play the role of a lead developer too. Uh, sometimes we don't have a visual designer on it. So like I said, it always depends on the project and we try not to force anything uh, when it doesn't make sense. So our evolving process uh, depends on the requirements. And, and it, the very first thing we always do is do a, a thorough discovery and kickoff phase where we really map out all of our, our requirements and, and scope out a project. So I think uh, Dr. Evil said it best that it really depends on the context. And I promise that is the last 90s shitty comedy reference we've got for you. Uh, so traditional waterfall design process, I won't dwell on this. Everyone knows what it is. You meet, you plan, you go off, you work in isolation, you send your UX person to their room and they do all your wireframes and come up with your user personas and they come back and hand that off to a designer and it's ping pong back and forth and there's huge approval processes. You're getting the client, the UX spec work, they're approving it, getting it to your designer, they're working by themselves in isolation. And what we found is not only is it frustrating and inefficient, you don't do as good of work because you're not working as a team. You're not you're not collaborating. And at the end of the day, I think, regardless of what industry you're in, you're going to do your best work when you're collaborating and sharing uh, people with different skills. So, you know, there's so many terminologies for it: lean, agile. I don't really like to get into the nitty gritty of that stuff. This is just kind of what we do, uh, depending on the project, like I said. But um, I'll kind of walk you through that, and then we'll get into some of the benefits. Actually, you know what? I was, I was uh, curious to say, um, so we have a lot of designers in here. Who, who here is offended by the idea of designing in the browser? Because a lot of designers, you know, are really hold true to the idea that you can't come up with a creative, good UI when you're working in code. Um, you know, it's, I've seen some of the back banter back and forth on the web, it seems kind of like uh, one of those arguments that is similar to a technology stack where people are fighting uh, over JSX or SAS or uh, the many heated stack conversations. But it seems like people are pretty open to the idea of designing in the browser. I have some design friends who are, you know, pretty hardcore design background and laugh whenever I say you can design in the browser. So just curious. Um, so as we get into process, uh, our first phase, like I said, is always discovery and kickoff. This is like the, mo the time when we have our most client involvement. We do research and interviews, uh, competitive analysis. We're interviewing all the key stakeholders. So right now, working on architecture firm's website, we interviewed um, the, key, the three partners. Uh, we brought their, one of their clients in to use their current site and see what they, what they felt was a hardship, what they were trying to find, could they get to it. We're documenting all this stuff as we go. So very basic UX stuff. Um, we do IA exercises always. Card sorts, I find, are hugely helpful, where we bring in, uh, whether it's a set of users or, like I said, the key stakeholders, and have them write out on index cards every single thing, that every piece of content, and we create a text taxonomy, a uh, content hierarchy out of that. Uh, we do user flows, and the key thing that we've kind of transitioned there is as we move into more of a um, stateless web app world, we're not talking about user flows through pages. We're talking about user flows through tasks, views, uh, et cetera. Um, and the last thing is content hierarchy. And that obviously comes uh, with all of the UX exercises that we do, the card sorts, things like that. So this is an example. Uh, we just are redesigning the Colorado Mountain College website. And uh, this was a card sort exercise we did. We had the client in our office and mapped everything out. I think those are really fun. The client feels really involved. It's kind of a collaborative process again. So uh, the tools, so each, on each of these phases, I'm going to talk about you know, what we do and then the tools and the teams involved. So 
Uh, on, on Discovery, we, we whiteboard is our favorite our favorite tool. It's our best friend. Uh, we scope everything. We do requirements on a whiteboard. Uh, sometimes we'll get into just like paper sketches. Um, it depends on the people involved. Some people prefer paper. Uh, and then we always have, you know, a brand spec. If we have a client that uh, we're just getting into, we're just doing digital work for them, we didn't do their brand and everything, we always ask them for, do you have brand documentation? What's your messaging, tone, look and feel, et cetera. Um, the teams involved on this are all those people I showed uh, earlier from our internal team, our key stakeholders, so the owners of the business uh, or, or the kind of people behind driving the project and any users that we can get our hands on. Uh, those are the most valuable that we found for key insights to, to kind of figure out what's working, what's not working, and what you can improve uh, on the next round. So phase two, UX strategy and design. Uh, here, you know, this is a phase that I think we, we interchange depending on the complexity of the project. We're not gonna do super detailed six user personas if we're doing a small, uh, you know, marketing site for a, you know, whatever it is. Uh, if we're doing a, we just redid cudenver.edu, which is, you know, a half a million dollar project and tons and tons of bureaucratic approval processes, we need to get the, the personas in front of them to say, is this aligned with who your users are? And does everyone know what a persona is? Yeah, cool. Um, User task flows, again, features not pages, and wireframes. Uh, this is an example of uh, just a sketched wireframe that we did for um, a password protected kind of experiential site uh, for a luxury uh, mountain home that they were trying to build with some big investors. So the tools in the team here, uh, Illustrator, like I showed, we use whiteboards and sketch just paper and pen a lot. Uh, Illustrator is great for wireframes if you're comfortable in, in that software. Um, there are tons and tons of UX tools. This list I put at the bottom is not even remotely comprehensive of all the UX tools that are going out right now because I think UX is such a buzz, buzzing uh, uh, practice right now. So UX Pin, Envision, Glyphy, Azure, and Paper Prototypes are all uh, pretty helpful. Um, Keynote, surprisingly, is still great for wireframing um, as well as prototyping. Shockingly um, efficient, and you can do some really slick stuff on it. Uh, the team involved there, we have our experience planner, our designer, and our technologist. Again, we're trying to keep the key people in there and not crush our budgets, but make sure that everyone's involved. Because if you have your UX person doing all of your UX and then handing it off to your designer, then you're just basically making your wires look pretty. And that's not what designers are here for and that's not why they get paid good digital salaries. So we have made the shift to push our budgets around and make sure that our designers, our technologists are involved from, from UX all the way through. And if there's any questions, please stop me. Or if you're getting bored, just brush it at me. Uh, lean design, art, phase three, art direction, initial design. Art direction is kind of an old ad world saying. I think it's kind of annoying, but uh, it, it does kind of explain this phase, I think. Uh, mood boards, look and feel, whatever you want to call it, style tiles. Uh, everyone does it their own way, but basically this is the visual design phase of our process. So where we used to, in that waterfall process, go in, we would do a look and feel phase, and then we would comp every single page or every single view at every single breakpoint, and we do a mobile page, and we do a tablet page, and that's a huge waste of time, and I'll get into the reasons why, but it is a massive waste of time, and with the tools out there, um, there's really no reason to be Photoshopping every single design, and to that point, I mean, the entire idea of a static Photoshop comp is static, and nothing on the web is static anymore. I mean, we, if you were at Aaron's talk yesterday morning about uh, designing with live data, it's so clear that the web is just completely evolved, and there's, there's no reason to be providing static comps anymore. That said, we usually do provide, like, the key page to illustrate how 
uh, this look and feel is going to translate into the web. So we'll design a home page if that's the most important page or a login page just to get that client comfortable level. Because if you show a client a mood board or a style tile or whatever it is, they can't envision it. They can't make that leap in their head. How is this going to translate onto my website? Uh, so we do we do design you know a key page. Uh, with that, we usually start a style guide or a UI kit. And you know if the budget's not there, we'll, we'll skip this step. But if there's any way to finagle it in there, we think that a UI kit um, is hugely beneficial as you start to get into designing in the browser, which is where where we're moving. You know, it, it depends because this, like the UI kit, if you're doing a formal UI kit, this can actually come often after you've built and designed in the browser, particularly if you're providing front end code with your UI kit, if it's an interactive style guide. Um, you know, like MailChimp had that one that was all over Twitter and really, really helpful. You can see the, the live code, you can expand it down and see the CSS and markup that goes behind it. Um, and it's obviously a tool for big development teams. Sometimes it's overkill, uh, but even just a, a PSD UI kit, I think, can be really helpful uh, at times. So this is actually an example of a, a style guide that we provided. And, and one thing I didn't mention is being the only developer, if we're working on cudenver.edu, we're not going to build that in-house. Uh, they actually had their internal dev team build that. So what we did is kind of created all these modular UI elements. And as you see, we have, you know, tiles, uh, different headline elements. And actually what I did is went in and provided CSS for their development team to implement in the lovely SharePoint. Uh, that's why I tried to stay out of that one. So design tools and team, this is nothing crazy. Illustrator, Photoshop. Sketch. Do you guys use Sketch? Anyone use Sketch for UI, UI design? Um, I've gotten in there and played around with it a lot. It's 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 pretty fun. I'm I'm definitely enjoying it. Uh, paper again, drawing, and the designer and the technologist are the key people on this one. So that's supposed to say phase four, uh, design and build. So this is where I like to kind of consider my wheelhouse and where I kind of geek out the most and get excited about projects because we're taking that look and feel and we're really building it out into something that lives and breathes and animates and transitions like any nice website should. Uh, so we're building out that UI using the style guide, using the look and feel that we designed uh, and creating this stuff from scratch, whether it's in J templates, liquid templates, HTML, always using SAS, fuck less, just kidding. Uh, and then real content. Uh, real content is so beneficial when you're designing, whether it's in the browser or in Photoshop or in Sketch or whatever it is. You reduce those edge cases if you have real content. And I have found in working in an agency with clients in different levels of sophistication for five years, it is the hardest thing to get your client or your, get your content done before you start designing. And if you can do it, it makes a world of difference because you're not designing with lorem ipsum. And if you're uh, if you're designing a headline that you're like, oh, this is going to be beautiful with like 30 characters, and they write a headline that has 60, 70, 80 characters, it can really fuck up your design. So I found that any time you can push, push, push for content approval before you get into design, it, it makes a world of difference. Uh, the tools, let's get the tools, browser, dev tools, Chrome dev tools, code pen, text editor, um, or if we're working with a lead dev or an external de development partner, that, that person's really involved, the designer, and then myself, the technologist, kind of trying to bridge that gap. Um, this is just an example of a site that I designed in the browser. Uh, this is our agency site, and obviously I have Chrome tools on fleek here. Uh, so that's supposed to say phase five, QA and deploy. Um, everyone's done this. It's the least fun part of any project. I won't even get into it. We use Trello. We use, uh, we use browser stack for all of our testing and unfortunately for the interns, they have to create our spreadsheets and 
go in and document everything. We've gotten a lot better. We don't uh, we don't support eight or seven or six like when I first got there. Um, we're doing kind of the Google stack, so two back from the production uh, browsers. Uh, we use Trello for bug tracking, which you know can be um, fun and frustrating. We our project manager is her name is Marina Berkto something, and she's Russian, gorgeous, tall redhead who just drops the fucking hammer, and uh, she is a beast in Trello. She'll get on your ass. So. Uh, this is a site we just launched for Anschutz Health and Wellness, which is, um, it's at, on the Anschutz Medical Campus. It's a gym, basically, but that's where they film the uh, America Lost Weight, or what is it called? The big Extreme Weight Loss Challenge. Uh, so, yeah, we, we did this site. It was really fun. We worked with a company called Voltage to do most of the dev, and I was just doing prototyping. And design, uh, but this is an example of Trello. Who's used Trello? Everyone. God. Um, so, when not to push this kind of a lean in-browser design approach? There are a number of cases where it doesn't necessarily make sense. Um, like I said, if you have a really large bureaucratic approval process, client that has 20 levels of approval, uh, it probably doesn't make sense to be designing in the browser. Um, if the feature list is constantly in flux or the vision isn't well defined, these are other cases where, you know, it probably is better to go with more of a traditional waterfall. It's just going to be more comfortable for the client, not as big of a leap for them to take. If the client is highly visual, if, I mean, we've had clients who just want to see that comp. They want to see it. They, they can't make that jump from seeing a... Uh, prototype that may not be polished on design because they'll get hung up on little fonts and brand colors and get really, really frustrated by seeing a working uh, working design comp. Um, and then design is highly illustrative or textural. Uh, obviously, really illustrated stuff is still best achieved in Illustrator. Um, for example, like the, the legwork site awesome fucking site, hugely illustrative. I don't think it'd be possible to design that in the browser. Um, textures, I don't know who's using a lot of textures, but uh, if you, if they're probably not best to design in CSS. So the big argument that people talk about is design versus code, and people hanging on to PSDs and people not, get, uh, not willing to kind of give up the, the finite control of the picture, uh, pixel-perfect design. And, you know, what I, the way I see it is not about design versus code. It's about design and code living together. And that's kind of illustrated in how we operate our look and feel, how we do those first comps and get right into the browser. And the way we work is I'll sit with our lead designer um, and we'll just crank through the front end. And it saves so much time and it's so much more efficient. And, you know, you get to hang with your homie the whole time. So it's more fun than doing it by yourself. Uh, if you're friends with your designer, um, which we we got a, a good talk uh, called "Fuck You Developer," and that kind of talks a little bit about that. Uh, so I think one of the things to illustrate in talking about design versus code, when when people first said, you know, we don't need to design in Photoshop anymore. Let's just we have Bootstrap. Let's just throw it together. Let's throw together a quick site. What you end up ended up with was a shit ton of bootstrap sites, and they all look the same. They have a blurry background with a dark overlay and a white sans serif text and a sweet, nice button and three buckets on what we do, and it's everything looks the same. And um, there's the bootstrapification of the web a couple years ago, and um, I think people kind of realized that and said, we can't just keep throwing together bootstrap sites. Um, and then I hope no one designed the Webatex site uh, here, but this is when you may just design in a silo with design tools and not any code. I don't know how you could layer that many textures uh, onto one design, but this is uh, when design and code come together, you can create magic. This is uh, work that Method did uh, for Salesforce, and they're they write a lot about their design process, their lean design process, and getting out of Photoshop as quick as possible. So this is an example of a site that they built um, using that process. 
for the reasons. Uh, there, there are more reasons than this, but these are the ones that I felt made most sense. Um, and the first one is interactivity. I mean, it's a no-brainer. Like, you can't... The, the, the sheer word static design comp conveys that it is not alive. And the web is way more than a static visual. Um, so interactivity, you're showing how menus animate. Uh, CodePen is such an awesome resource. This was actually, I think, done by uh, Code, uh, Code Drops. Uh, if anyone checks that stuff out, they, she, she's awesome. They do really great work. Um, this is a site that I did uh, for a holiday project. We called it Wonderful Colorado. Um, essentially, it was born from us wanting to do something more than, you know, a kitschy little iPod case or whatever for your holiday gift. And so we built this uh, field guide to Colorado using all of our employees' uh, favorite things to do to kind of tell that story. And so this is a site that I designed in the browser uh, with our lead designer. He did all the illustrations. So the this kind of shows you... Oops. Um, there were a lot of animated UI throughout the whole thing. Uh, they actually detected what time of day your user was coming from. So that's where it says good afternoon. These were really fun. These, uh, I don't know if you've noticed that, but the bookshelf falling over. Um, just a really, really fun project to work on animated UI. I think another thing that really spurred this movement is uh, responsive design because it's such a headache to create comps in multiple sizes. It doesn't matter if you start mobile first or if you start desktop first and you go back to it, it, it always sucks. So um, I think that was kind of the last draw when people were like, okay, we got to find another solution. And this is an example of how you can play with the elastic artboard instead of having a fixed artboard. Another key thing is uh, I think that writing your design in code really makes you think about systems. Um, if you're just in Photoshop designing, making things look pretty, you're not necessarily thinking about how that plays across your entire web application or your site. And this is obviously SAS uh, views and how to, an example of how to build a SAS framework. Um, but it's all modular. It's all system, system thinking. So if you know you're changing your button, you're not changing your button on five different PSD files. You're changing your button on your variable and your, and your SAS. And from an efficiency standpoint, it's huge. From a, from a system thinking standpoint, it's huge. Because if you're a designer, you need to be thinking about the ecosystem uh, and, and not just making things look pretty. Uh, typography rendering. Um, Browsers render type different than design tools. And they may be subtle, but design perfectionists kind of like care about that shit. And if you're showing your client something in Photoshop, then it's going to render an IE on their computer totally different than they might get frustrated. Probably won't, but it's those little things that, you know, it makes sense to start shifting. So progress and productivity. This is, again, one of the biggest things for me is like, if you're designing in, in Photoshop and you are laying stuff out and floating left and right, uh, you're moving it around, you're looking at your grids, you're doing all this stuff. Well, if you're in code, you have your grid set up. You have your max width, whether it's percentage or pixel based. You can just float left and it proliferates across all your designs. Um, you're, you're, you're not duplicating your efforts. If you're designing in Photoshop and then moving over to code and changing everything back, you're just duplicating efforts and wasting time. So from a productivity standpoint, um, it's a no-brainer. So testing your designs. Um, I'm sure everyone uses Xcode uh, and the iPhone simulator, but this is a way that, you know, if you're, if you're, you can't really test the static design. It just doesn't work like that. So this is a, another reason. So less detailed documentation. That's huge, too. I mean, if you're providing PSDs to a dev team, you have to do so much documentation to make sure that they're going to get it right. Because if you just give them the PSD and expect them to go in and get the padding and all the, uh, all the details right, you're, you're going to come out with a bad product. So if anyone's ever specced out a PSD with little comments for every little thing, it is super frustrating. And ain't nobody got time for that. 
designing with data again. That's another thing. You just you you expel those edge cases that where your design is not going to work. Um, it's hugely important. And again, user experience is the, the responsibility of everyone on the team. That's what our team looks like in the office. Um, we're so pumped in suits every day. This is this is the way we live. Uh, but again, it's 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 not falling on one person. Not all of these UX choices are falling on one person. Not all these design choices are falling on one person. And not all the execution of code is not falling on one person. One person. If you work as a team, what you get is a team product. So the tools um, for developers who are getting into design, I think uh, this is kind of the most common probably would be to have, you get the most finite control, you can build however you want, you can include whichever dependencies you need, whichever frameworks and build processes you want. Grunt is awesome and hugely popular right now. Um, any text editor, uh, I use SAS, I use Bourbon, uh, it makes writing SAS really nice and easy. Um, I think for more like designer focused who can code a little bit, you can use tools like CodeKit that'll let you get in, you're not using, um, the terminal, you're building basically like a grunt tool. Uh, it's kind of the difference between the GitHub app versus like GitHub in your command line. Um, it's really user friendly and designer friendly. CodePen. Um, this is, I love CodePen. It's one of my favorite things uh, to mess around with. This is an example. Uh, this is one of our agencies. Mantras, if you will, and um, this was right when uh, this was right when Background Clip was kind of released. I think it was like six or seven months ago, and you could start clipping images through text. And I thought, what if you did a GIF through the text? And the only way to figure it out is to do it, to write it. You could never achieve this in a design tool. Uh, so get into CodePen, whip up a quick. Fast instance and throw it together. Um, this was my first ever featured code pen on the home page, so I'm pretty proud of it. Who uses code pen? Framer. Um, I played around with it a little bit. Uh, it's essentially an animation. UI kind of built mostly for app, uh, mobile UI animation transitions. Uh, I think it's all built on CoffeeScript, so pretty easy to get into, not a huge learning curve. Um, and again, shows how you can animate pages because that's hugely valuable to the client. And they get the little like bubbles in their stomach when they see their site start to animate. That's way cooler than a flat comp. Atomic, basically the same thing, but it's like, WYSIWYG, I haven't messed around with it yet, but it's similar to Framer. And After Effects, which is tried and true. People have been designing UI on After Effects for a long time, and you can find tons of examples. This one's on drum, but just how to animate your, your UI. So I think the, the key things that I walked away with in building this and thinking about this are that we can sketch with technology. We don't need to think of creativity as a product of the tool involved. Um, people are creative, not tools. So allow yourself to use whatever tool makes most sense and, and you'll come to the best solution. Static mockups, dead, done, kill them. And like I said, creativity is not a product of the tool, it's a product of the person, so that's it. Do you guys have any questions? Yeah, you know, I think it's been uh, it's been a learning experience for us. I think we've we've been able to figure out which clients are going to be on board with it. Um, some of the more forward focusing or like less sophisticated. If you don't have a client that's that sophisticated, you can usually push this stuff on them if they trust you. And so, get that trust early and often, and you can kind of push whatever process you want. We have. Um, a really small kind of startup client that was so on board with this because they loved seeing the design come to life. 
you know, we came back after a week and showed the homepage prototype, and it's the one that I showed that sketch of. It's um, a login screen. I'm actually working with Eric Glasser on it. We're doing it in Node, um, Angular, uh, what's the full stack? It's a Node Angular app. And uh, the you go from a lock screen, it kind of validates you and presents this home screen with your name uh, there. And it was really fun to build out the animation. I was really excited to build out the UI on that. And when we showed it to them a week later, they were so jazzed up. Like it was, it was so much more than what could have been conveyed in two static comps. We were showing a lock screen. Can you imagine them locking in and then, and then there's going to be a spinner loader and you're going to see that you know someone's going to get validated and it's going to expand like this. And you try and explain a transition, that's not going to work. So we found that. If you can gain that trust early, um, it's, it's, they love it, is what I found. Yeah. Oh, for sure, tons. That's why I think we, because even when we were doing traditional waterfall, we're designing stuff in Photoshop and you get it into code and it doesn't work. I mean, even if you're the best designer, you don't know all those use cases where, oh, wait, now this left rail, now that's not really going to work that way. So we've found that regardless of your process, whatever you start to design in a static tool is going to change as you build and as your content gets approved. So um, that example of the, the one where we did, we designed the home page uh, after the login screen and the whole entire second half, like the, the top section was the same, but as we got the content, as we started to build out, do the UI transitions and stuff, it all changed. And I think that flexibility is like what keeps me excited about it because especially as a front end dev, if you're, if you are in a waterfall process and you are expected to create pixel perfect comps and take a PSD from some designer and make it beautiful, there's no creativity involved. And so, I think the challenge of figuring it out as you start to get real content and, and change your design is, is what I kind of keeps me jazzed. When I wasn't doing design, when I was just doing front end, that was what, what kept me going. Yeah, exactly, yeah, yeah. I think, um, you know, it's, that's definitely a challenge, too. Mm -hmm. I'll, I'll be the first to say it. Uh, hmm. I think our most common way is, like, I think we're supported by the fact that our content is never approved. So even if we have a prototype, they know that their content is still being in flux. So that helps to kind of push that process. But, I mean, you're right. There's really no easy way to say, like, get this. This is a prototype. It's not responsive fully yet. It's not fully tested. And they don't quite get that, but I think it goes back to getting that early trust. I mean, if they hire you as an expert, you gotta just kind of tell them the way it has to be and involve them. I think that's also huge is being involved in uh, in the UX phase and being involved, seeing all of your prototypes as you go. They feel like they're part of the process and they trust you more. That would be nice.
would agree, and I, I didn't actually talk about that, but in that in that build prototype phase, I think that dev tools is like one of the most important tools to have. If you're designing in the browser and being able to get into dev tools and tweak the color, tweak the typography, font sizes, everything, layout, like it's hugely important. I mean, you can just grab that code and get it into your build. Automatically, yeah. Thanks, guys.